20 people shot, several at point-blank range. Many of the survivors are being treated behind me here at the University Medical Center. And now authorities want to know what caused the alleged gunman, Jared Lee Lofner, to snap. We delve into the narrative of a once unassuming and gifted young man whose actions catapulted him into nationwide infamy. His harrowing deeds will echo through the annals of Tucson, Arizona's history as its most grim chapter. We extend our deepest sympathies and prayers to all families who bore the brunt of the unhinged actions of this one man. Welcome to Tucson, Arizona, a radiant city nestled within the arid landscapes of the United States' southwestern corner. Noted as one of the oldest cities in the nation, Tucson is situated a mere 60 miles from the Mexican border. The city's culture is steeped in Mexican influences, making it unique. Locals would tell you that the city's charm lies in the abundance of delectable Mexican cuisine intertwined with Latino music. Outsiders may perceive it merely as a desert settlement, oblivious to Tucson's splendid weather and picturesque mountain delights. Despite its recent urban expansion, the city retains its welcoming demeanor. Home to approximately 800,000 residents, Tucson preserves its small-town ambience. Ask anyone to describe the city, and you'll likely hear it's safe. On the morning of January 8, 2011, Gabriel Giffords, a freshly re-elected senator, was poised to kick off a Congress on your corner session. This initiative facilitated direct dialogues between politicians and their constituents, fostering discussions about various issues and plans. Giffords, fondly known as Gabby, was keen on maintaining a strong bond with her townsfolk. She eschewed formal settings, valuing accessibility, and staying attuned to the community's needs. Many eagerly anticipated their encounter with the senator on that bright, azure-skied Saturday. However, unbeknownst to the cheerful crowd, a threat was looming. At exactly 10.10 a.m., Tucson's tranquility was shattered by the actions of a 22-year-old man, Jared Lee Lofner. In a chilling 17-second rampage, Lofner claimed the lives of six individuals and left 13 others wounded. Among his victims was the congresswoman herself, believed to be his primary target. But what drove Lofner to undertake such drastic actions, causing irreparable harm to many lives? Were his actions born out of justice or the product of a troubled mind? Let's delve into the life of Jared Lofner. Born on September 10, 1988, Jared Lee Lofner was the only child in a working-class family. His mother was a respected manager for the Parks and Recreation Department of Pima County, and his father was in the auto restoration business. Lofner was part of a tight-knit group of friends in his early years. He bonded over music with Leila Chavez, a former friend, around 12 or 13. Their friendship deepened when Leila decided to form a band, and Jared, a bass player at the time, would join her for jam sessions. Tyler Zorn, another old friend, recalls a different side of Jared. In their teenage years, they engaged in typical adolescent mischief. Drinking, causing neighborhood disturbances, smashing mailboxes, and so forth. Despite these instances of delinquency, his peers did not perceive him as a threat. However, as Lofner transitioned into his late teens, the generous laid-back musician began to morph into something darker. A pivotal moment in his life was a failed high school romance. After a brief relationship, the pair parted ways, leaving Jared heartbroken. He reportedly felt betrayed, leading him to distance himself from his friends and withdraw from school. As he plunged into isolation, Lofner eventually dropped out of high school in 2006. His gradual descent into a solitary existence flew under the radar. Yet five years later, his actions would shock the nation. On January 8, 2011, at 12.29 a.m., Jared Lofner secured his accommodations in room 411 at Tucson's Motel 6. Little did anyone suspect that a horrific killing spree would unfold in 10 hours. As the night advanced, Lofner was seen making multiple brief visits to a nearby convenience store. By 1 a.m., he had collected a roll of freshly developed film showcasing self-portraits clicked mere hours ago. These included several images of him clad in women's underwear and one featuring a 9mm gun atop a U.S. textbook. Lofner returned to his room with the developed photos at 4.12 a.m., promptly immersing himself in his subversive online world. After uploading these peculiar images, he spent the remainder of the night dispatching emails to his internet acquaintances, sharing his ideologies and bidding them farewell. Lofner had begun distancing himself from offline relationships in the preceding months, favoring an online community. 
his MySpace records revealed a penchant for revolutionary literature, including Mein Kampf. He was particularly fond of a site home to conspiracy theorists and skeptics, where he hoped his unusual viewpoints would find acceptance. His posts were often extensive, touching upon the U.S. Constitution, the illegality of high schools, and a belief in gold and silver as the only credible currency. His views became so absurd that some online acquaintances urged him to seek professional psychological help. During his tenure at Pima Community College, Loeffner displayed a concerning pattern. Whenever sensitive topics such as abortion or war were broached, he responded with laughter and inappropriate jokes. His unaltered, smug demeanor, even when confronted by peers or teachers, was disconcerting. His constant assertion that others were idiots who failed to comprehend the reality of things was deeply troubling. Observers noted a significant shift in his behavior, continuing to evolve with each passing day. One staff member at the college vividly remembers overhearing Loeffner's ramblings one day. The chilling tone of his voice prompted her to share her concerns with a co-worker via email. She firmly believed in Loeffner's potential for violence, speculating he might bring a gun to class one day. Unfortunately, her hunch was not unfounded. Loeffner's disturbing online video was the final straw for the college authorities. In the video, he roamed the Pima Community College campus with a handheld camera, criticizing it as the epitome of financial waste in American education, among other derogatory comments. Following this incident, the college authorities convened a meeting with Loeffner and his parents, warning of his expulsion if his behavior did not improve. He was suspended from attending classes, with a precondition for return being a favorable mental health evaluation from a psychiatrist. Predictably, Loeffner could not produce the necessary documentation. How's it going? Thanks for the bee. I'm, I'm pissed off. What's that? We are looking at students who have been tortured. This is Pima Community College, one of the biggest scams in America. The students are so illiterate that it affects their daily lives. It is so illegal to sell this book under the Constitution. We are also censored by our freedom of speech. They're controlling the grammar. All the teachers that you have are being paid illegally and have a legal authority over the Constitution of the United States under the First Amendment. This is genocide in America. On the morning of January 8, 2011, at 7.04 a.m., merely three hours before he would wreak havoc, Jared Loeffner departed from his motel room. His destination was a store where he aimed to purchase ammunition for his newly acquired handgun. However, his attempt to secure 9mm ammunition was thwarted, as his erratic behavior raised alarms for the sales clerk, who falsely claimed they were out of that specific ammunition. Undeterred, Loeffner at 7.31 a.m. sought out another store and this time, without raising any red flags, managed to purchase eight boxes of ammunition, amounting to a total of 400 rounds. With merely four hours left before his primary target, Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords was due. Loeffner was on the move once more. This time, he was en route home. As Loeffner neared his house's entrance, he was intercepted by his father, who inquired about the contents of his bag. Wishing to conceal the fact that he was carrying 400 rounds of ammunition, Jared deflected the question, leading to a heated argument between the two. Their relationship, already strained in recent months, was further tested that morning. Concerned about Jared's conduct, Randy and Amy Loeffner confiscated his car keys as a punitive measure. Despite their attempts to communicate with him, they could not progress. Regrettably, they were unaware of the horrifying act their son was about to commit. In their front yard, the confrontation between father and son continued. Unable to access his car, Jared retrieved a black bag from the trunk and walked off, leaving his father puzzled about his intentions. Needing a mode of transportation, Jared hailed a cab. Within minutes, he would initiate a killing spree that would stun the nation. By 10 a.m. on the same day, Tucson, Arizona, one of America's oldest cities, was rocked by a brutal killing spree perpetrated by a troubled 22-year-old. Just an hour before, an air of tranquility pervaded the city. The early January weather, a pleasant 70 degrees made for an ideal outdoor environment, and the residents were looking forward to the arrival of Senator Gabrielle Giffords. 
The day's agenda at the local Safeway included a Congress on Your Corner event, an initiative by Congresswoman Giffords to facilitate interaction with her constituents. Supporters were alerted about the event the previous day, providing an opportunity for Giffords to gather insights into their political concerns. Little did Giffords and her team know the seemingly relaxed gathering was under the shadow of a severe threat. Jared Lee Loeffner harbored a deep-seated hatred for the Congresswoman, a hostility that traced back to an incident from years prior. In fact, Jared had encountered Gabrielle Giffords at a gathering akin to the one planned for January 8th. During a prior networking event, he seized the opportunity to pose a question to the congresswoman while in a queue. Jared told her, What is the essence of government if words lack significance? The question presented to congresswoman Giffords needed more context, leaving her uncertain of an appropriate response. An associate of hers thanked Jared for his question and promptly moved on to the next, a decision that Jared perceived as a slight. This perceived disrespect ignited a growing animosity within Jared that persisted over the ensuing months and years. The animosity did not stop there. Further interactions between Jared and Congresswoman Giffords fueled his growing hatred. He sent a letter to her office, to which her representatives responded. However, they unintentionally addressed the response to Mr. Loeffner instead of simply Loeffner, an error that further fueled his ire and confirmed his belief of his intellectual superiority over those in power. This led to his disdain for authority figures, including politicians and educators. But his actions could not be solely attributed to these beliefs. Many people harbor negative views about politicians' capability to govern, yet they do not resort to violence. This kind of violent rampage is not a political act but a manifestation of psychopathology. It is plausible to assert that even if Jared Loeffner had never interacted with Congresswoman Giffords, he would have committed a similar act under these circumstances. At 9.54 a.m., Loeffner arrived at the Safeway store by taxi. His behavior prior to his violent spree suggested complete transparency and coherence. He had enough money to pay the taxi fare and insisted on receiving his change. His actions clearly showed that he was aware of his surroundings and intentions. No one could argue that Loeffner was mentally unstable when the tragedy occurred. His intended target, Congresswoman Giffords, was just a few yards away, about to meet the constituents who had been waiting to interact with her. No one had any inkling of what was to transpire. Approximately 25 individuals were in line, eager for a chance to converse with Gabrielle Giffords. The crowd comprised elderly women, children, and couples all innocent individuals who saw this as an opportunity to effect positive change in their community by addressing their concerns directly to the congresswoman. Gabe Zimmerman, an aide to the congresswoman, was present, efficiently organizing the crowd into a queue. Everything appeared to be running smoothly. Among the witnesses was a woman who was not particularly interested in politics. She and her husband had come to the grocery store for their shopping. As they walked in, she noticed a man walking in the opposite direction, with an odd expression on his face. Little did she know that this man was Jared Loeffner, who would tragically end many lives that day. At 10.10 a.m., the violence erupted. Amidst Giffords addressing the crowd, Loeffner charged through, brandishing a gun, and began firing. Gabrielle Giffords was shot in the head. Gabe Zimmerman, who was in close proximity, rushed to assist her. In his attempt to help, Zimmerman was caught in the line of fire and lost his life. The sound of the gunfire startled those not attending the meeting. Some even confessed they hadn't identified the sound initially, as they'd never heard a gunshot. Panic ensued when a shopper reported seeing a group of people rushing into the store, screaming that the congresswoman had been shot. As the chaos continued, Loeffner turned his gun towards the then-district director, Ron Barber. In an act of heroism, Judge John Roll jumped in front of Barber, pushing him out of the line of fire. Regrettably, Roll was hit by a bullet and lost his life. An onlooker made a futile attempt to revive him with CPR. In the ensuing pandemonium, a bystander took the opportunity to hit Loeffner across the back with a chair. This caused Loeffner to lose his balance, enabling another man to seize his wrist and attempt to immobilize him. The man blocked Loeffner from escaping and hit him repeatedly while holding onto his wrist. Loeffner was eventually overpowered and fell to the ground. Amidst cries of, Get the gun! Loeffner tried to grab a fully loaded magazine. Still, another individual snatched it away from him, along with the gun, leaving him defenseless. The man who successfully disarmed Loeffner pointed the gun at him in a warning. With Loeffner now subdued, the crowd regained some composure and the police were alerted. 
Lofner was taken into custody and his identity began to emerge in the aftermath of the tragic event. Just advising Safeway, Ina and Oracle, County's going to be working a shooting. Um, we've got multiple, multiple, multiple calls. They have not called us for assistance. I'm assuming they're quite 10 6 at this point. Uh, we've been informed Gabriel Giffords is involved. What led a lifelong Tucson inhabitant to embark upon such a horrifying carnage, a callous onslaught that profoundly rattled his local community? The massacre's duration was just 17 seconds, yet Lofner managed to discharge a 33-round magazine into an unprepared crowd. The merciless assault resulted in six fatalities and 13 injuries. Five minutes after the final discharge, law enforcement arrived at the scene. Lofner was seized without delay, handcuffed, and distanced from the horrific aftermath of his spree. His initial statement to the police was his lone involvement in the incident, possibly seeking personal notoriety. With the assailant in custody, survivors began to recuperate, assisting one another. Among the victims, a nine-year-old girl was found lifeless. A first-hand witness mentioned the indelible memory of unsuccessful CPR performed on the child. On her way to the hospital, she tragically succumbed. Among the critically injured was Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords, who suffered a life-threatening gunshot wound to her head. Despite the severity of her injury, she remarkably survived. According to her medical team, the bullet entered just above her left eye, but did not cross the hemispheres. In the aftermath, she responded promptly to commands and soon progressed to using her iPad and venturing outdoors. At the Institute for Rehabilitation and Research in Houston, Giffords underwent intensive daily therapy, regaining her cognitive and physical abilities. In just two months, she verbalized nursery rhymes and conversed over the phone. She was also seen navigating hallways, using a shopping cart, and performing squats to regain strength. In June, five months post-shooting, her first images were released, capturing her radiant smile. Seven months later, Giffords made an uplifting return to the House of Representatives to vote on the debt ceiling deal, receiving a standing ovation. She, however, resigned in 2012 to concentrate on her recovery and has since become a notable advocate for gun control. On March 9, 2011, Jared Lee Lofner was arraigned on 49 charges at the Arizona Superior Court, with a possible death sentence upon conviction. His initial court appearance in May 2011 was marked by outbursts, erratic behavior, and a sense of disconnect, leading to his forcible removal. Deemed unfit for trial, he remained in custody as his mental health deteriorated. Lofner developed psychotic symptoms, including hallucinations and obsessive behavior, leading to physical ailments like infected foot sores. In June 2011, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, and the judge ordered forcible medication. His mental health condition could suggest a misguided belief in combating evil through his actions. After 14 months of medication, he was competent for trial. Facing potential capital punishment, his defense team persuaded him to plead guilty, avoiding execution. Lofner confessed to 19 of the 49 original charges, earning him seven life sentences plus 140 years, ensuring he will never leave prison under current law. Lofner's case has rekindled intense debates on mental health and gun control laws. Once a rebellious teen and talented musician, he transformed overnight into a ruthless killer. We welcome your thoughts on this case in the comments below.